You remember the first job they put you on? I do. It was for Jennifer Lopez, wow. J Lo, before she was J Lo, <laughs> but just before. And it was reading all of the emails that came in to Jennifer Lopez. Welcome to another Something in the Water podcast. I'm Uncle Dave Griffin along with Ty Manning. Yay. What the? Yeah. yeah. I and am our guest. Artist formerly known as Sean Clark. <laughs> <laughs> our guest this time is Jim Cl- Jim Parker. I started to call you something else, but uh, <laughs> call it just like Colonel that. Colonel Jim Mr. Parker. Mr. Jim Parker. Good to have you here, buddy. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. And before we get too far into this, talking with Jim and everything, uh, let me just say that Sean is okay. Our good buddy Sean Clark is all right. He just got a hold of a little bit of that South Georgia crud, and he kind of killed his uh, vocal cords. There. So I think it was South Georgia crud. It might, you know, we just kind of got back from that uh that uh, road trip with the Uncle Dave's Way Cross Stagecoach where you we might went have everywhere some Joshua to, the, tree crud. to the West Coast and back again. Could, could be some old cactus crud he got a hold of out there in the West. But uh, we wish him well, and uh, he'll be back on here before you know it. So, Jim. Yes. Jim has uh, worked in the – he's uh, originally from – uh, I'm from here, actually. Cross, actually. Yeah. yeah, I was born in Athens, and yeah. I grew up here. Um, I originally spent a few years in South Carolina, which is my other side of the family, but right. for the most part, I'm way cross through and through. Yeah, man. And uh, he's uh, he's uh, n- not a, uh, a musician uh, like the rest of us, but he has worked in the music industry. That's right. I was wondering, actually, if I'm, am I the, because I've, you know. I'm, no, we've had dancers on here. Okay, before, dancers. So fantastic. Dancers. All right. You're going to have to dance later, man. All right, all right. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair uh, enough. Who else we had, Justin? That's uh, okay. Good, good, good. That makes me feel better because yeah. I was a little bit like I'm like I'm watching these episodes. I'm like, man, there's some good musicians on here. What are they doing? Do they think I play something? Because I do not, you know. Um, but yeah, I appreciate it, man. And yes, uh, sir. Yeah, well, we I really you, like you being had, on here. You had a heck of a lot that we could talk about. Well, you know? Let's do it then. Yeah. So, uh, your mother. Uh, Brenda Adams. I have known uh, her and her, uh, well, one of her sisters, Lillane in particular. Back in the days when I was playing music, uh, the beginning of uh, some of my early bands around 74, 75, uh, Bruce Wood was the drummer for a band that I was in. That, of course, his wife was Lillane. And, uh, your mother is Lee Lane's sister, and uh, they were uh, Burtons, I believe was their last name. That's that correct. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and that so, was their maiden name, Burton. That's right, because my grandmother, <clears throat> who's still alive, Lunell Burton, mm-hmm. uh, you know, she and my papa uh, grew up on St. Mary's Avenue, uh, had a house on St. Mary's Avenue, and they had that pretty much all my life. Mm-hmm. And it was my mom and 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 Lelaine and Teresa, mm-hmm. who actually had polio. Right. She was one of the sort of original polio children. They went to Warm Springs and stuff wow. when she, you know, when she was a little girl and stuff like that. And so, yeah, that's yeah, my family. Polio yeah. was a big thing in in, yeah. in my childhood and their yeah. childhood and yeah. everything because that was when the uh, the shot came out. That's right. You know, that's right. And uh, we all had to line up in, yeah. in uh, the lower grades of elementary school and uh, 
Seemed like that polio shot. That polio might have been the one that left a a Cheerio on your arm. Yeah, I yeah. Believe so a lot it was, of wasn't it? Yeah. A lot of the boomers have that sort of yes. three sort of thing. I in mean, there. it swelled up just yeah. like a Cheerio. Yeah, you know? and yeah. That's what we were all proud of them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and uh, I tell you another thing about the the Burton family. They put out some good looking women. For sure. Even 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 your your grandmother. Oh, for sure. Oh, and she my still goodness. looks great too. Yes, it's amazing. She does. she does. It's a little bit something in the water because like I don't know where these like southern you know, it's like a little bit beach boys, southern girls sort of thing or whatever. <laughs> I mean, it really is like, you know, they're a little bit like too good looking for their own good or whatever, you know. <laughs> Um, well, your but, family was blessed. With yeah, them now, for sure, for that. sure, for sure. And they were sweethearts too. Uh-huh. You know, they were they were yes. good people inside too. Yep, yep. <laughs> so that's kind of how I knew of your family, and yep. then of course, uh, now uh, Ty actually went to college with some of your brothers, yeah, yeah. right? Well, yeah. Well, as we were talking, yeah, I didn't about realize I had I didn't realize who you were until I got until we started talking earlier. But no, but I know Ben and Burton really well. Yeah, yeah, probably so that, too well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save some of those stories. Which is awesome. Yeah. So the last time that I saw both of you were was at LL Creek yeah, while yeah. the Barefoot Hookers were playing, and that show was amazing. And I don't know if like I don't know how to explain it, but like. You know, you're in Waycross, Georgia, first off, and you're in LL Creek, and so you don't expect too much. I mean, I'm I'm just saying, like, you don't, you know, but it becomes this sort of intimate, sort of beautiful experience where everybody knows the words to every song, and everybody knows the band, and they couldn't wait for this band to come, and it was... Just incredible. It was like being at, I don't know, I, you know, I've been to a lot of shows, but the ones that are sort of personal and special like that yeah. are like few and far between, you know? Yeah, I think so, the secret was wait 10 years to play. <laughs> hey, fair enough. You know, it, it really was. And that's what I, I think I had like texted Burton. I'm like, you're coming, right? You know, Larry, it's Lita's birthday, right? Yeah. And uh, Larry says that they're playing, man. When's the last time that they played? And he's like, I don't know. It's been like <laughs> years, you know? And I said, you better be here for this. And so mm-hmm. he was. And it was incredible. And your yeah. mom and dad were there. And it was just, it felt like family. It you was, know, yeah, that yeah, whole was, show it felt it like a, family. It, reunion. it, it felt so special. Weird. And it felt like something like... um you know, what am I even supposed to be here kind of thing, like that special kind of thing, you know, where everybody's singing along and I'm just enjoying the, the show. You know? yeah, it, was, it, was a, it was a crazy night. It was fun. Well, for those of y'all uh, watching and listening that might not understand what we're talking about, L.L. Creek is a venue here in Waycross. It's a, a restaurant slash a performance venue, and uh, uh, it's been known as uh, the Creek uh, over the years, uh, I believe it started out in another location called uh, uh, Cypress Creek. It was Woody's before Woody's, that, Woody's, Woody's yeah. Barbecue. Then they became uh, uh, a uh, they got out of the Woody's franchise and became uh, exclusive to themselves. It was called Cypress Creek, and then it had another location. Then the third location is where it's at now, and they've. Added on a huge uh, performance yeah. uh, venue, and uh, it's great. And uh, we're talking about <laughs> Ty Manning and the Barefoot Hookers uh, was uh, was one of Ty's <laughs> past bands. <laughs> yeah, well, uh... <laughs> yeah, y'all used to play all the festivals here in town that I would put on. Yeah, yeah. The, the and girls. you had uh, not played together in a good long while. Yeah, it's been a while. We'd it's all kind of. Ten years. We'd all kind of grown up. Everybody's got jobs. and <laughs> So I, this I was had, kind uh, of a reunion. Yeah, yeah. We had a, it was sort of like a and reunion. It was awesome. And, and it was mm-hmm. crazy because it was Lita's birthday. And then. Lita is one of the owners um, of the place. She, every, we used to always play for her birthday. She had a big birthday bash. And every time we'd come, we'd. 
we probably done Alita's birthday luau every time <laughs> in every one of the bars that she owned over the last 20 years. And, and so, she got hold of you this time. So she, she called She used to always call me and be like, can, can the hookers come play? And I was like, well, everybody's, law, John's in law school and Josh is having another kid. And so it never could get everything to line up. So it finally just lined up. And, and it was just a magical night. But it was. The, the cool thing about, uh, well, the Waycross you're talking about. Well, you said that when you said barefoot hookers, it made me think. Uh, when the first couple times we played in Waycross, they wouldn't put barefoot hookers on the sign. <laughs> They're like, we're not gonna, we're gonna get some weird, weird crap if we do that. So they put John Tonge and Ty Manning's band. It's almost as good. That's almost <laughs> yeah, as good. It's because we were from here, you know. But after we did it three or four times, they, they finally wanted to put the sign. But the interesting thing is it's not barefoot like no shoes. It's barefoot like bears. Like a bear, yeah. Like a bear. <laughs> a bear foot hooker. So you kind of put that in your head and no, toss it around. Cool. Had bit. you ever seen us before? I had seen you one other time probably 20 years ago yeah, with yeah. Burton. Yeah, you Burton, know, Burton was at, cause we were the way huge... Playboys before the – yeah, man. That was our working name, and yeah, I'm pretty man. sure Burton had something to do with that. <laughs> there's actually there's actually a recording of Burton and Bid and me and John and Josh all of us just singing along to my little rec- hand recorder thing. That's awesome. I got to I'll just see if I can find it and send it to you. I'll send it to Justin <laughs> for sure. Definitely send it to me. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I texted him before I came here, and uh, I asked him if he wanted me to you know, say anything or anything, but he did not know that you were going to be here. So it was a, yeah. uh, you know, I should, if I had yeah. said that, he might've had some different answers or yeah. whatever. But, he would have uh, showed yeah. up and tailgate. Yeah, yeah, here I am. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, he, you've got a huge fan in him and definitely in me too, because of him. And that night was just incredible. And it was kind of the first time proper that I'd been in there for a show too. And, just be, you know, I'm right up at the stage too, right next to the speakers, and it just sounded so good. The speakers were just so perfect, and there was no distortion, and I could hear every single well, that's awesome. note that you were playing and every word you were saying, you know. And so it was just really a magical night. It really was. Um, and just the fact of there, there was. I told Larry weeks later after that, you know, the same thing. I was like, it sounded great, you know. But I said, but everybody was there, you know. It was like it felt like everybody in Waycross sort of came out for that. And uh, and he goes, yeah, even, you know, even your mom came. I said, that's right. That's right. Yeah. She did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was right across the dance floor from y'all on the right-hand front. Sad. Yeah, so I was hearing the exact same it. thing. And oh, I kept for sure. Looking over there to see uh, Sam Stovall, and and then there, <laughs> and then there's uh, his wife uh, Peggy, and uh, just Brenda, and, then, <laughs> and, and dang, that, the whole gang's here. <clears throat> Who was running sound that night? Was it uh, Trey? Well, we had Trey and Trey was there. Okay, I think we were, we were worried about it. We were worried about the sound because it's such a big room and it's it kind of boomy. Mm-hmm. Um, but we we Larry uh, Larry got Trey, and then we had two of the guys in our band are sound guys. So we they we we had a team working on it, and I think just having that many people in there. Oh yeah, yeah, absorbed a lot of the helps. the yeah. reverb and stuff. So sounded it, it so just, good. The people were doing. We're giving us the energy and buff muffling our energy back. So it's like it's pretty pretty magical night, like you said. It really was. And it, I'm ready yeah. to do it again, but Yeah, man. <laughs> it's, I think that's if you did it every weekend, it probably wouldn't be as magical every weekend. Right. Yeah. There was something there and and also and I don't like I'm not trying to like bring it down or anything, but like that night was Lita's birthday, but <laughs> Oh yeah. The day before, I think. Yeah. Maybe even that yeah, day. Her oh, husband. Yeah, right. that's right. Who that's right. again, everybody, you know, the community loved and they loved Lita and mm-hmm. everybody was like, you know, this has been happening for years or whatever. And he had been suffering from cancer yeah. for years and years and years. 
and he loved you guys too mm-hmm. and was like when he you, was there during the planning of this is going to be her birthday and they're going to yeah. come and stuff mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. well you, you said you didn't want to bring it down but i think you can bring it back up with that same thing because like i'm pretty sure i don't want to get religious on y'all but there was some higher power mm-hmm. i think the magic in that building was because jerry would have wanted us all to have a good time especially lita for and sure i know she was was down but Man, I think and, it was good medicine for Lita. Oh man, good it was medicine it, for everybody. It was there. awesome, and and I remember sort of Lita being there, and it was crazy because I thought, oh man, how is this going to go or whatever, you know? And it's, and then you guys are just jamming out, you know, and I'm like, well, it's going great. And then I see Lita, and she's just running the bar, man. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. just serving drinks yeah, and doing bar back and just doing just everything, you know, just look, just blam, blam, blam. I'm like, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. You know, there's another part that sort of made it sort of like magical. It really did. You, did. did it you was see different. The, the shirts that she had made her weight staff? <laughs> yeah, man. What, got, what did it say? I think it said, I got barefoot with the hookers. <laughs> <laughs> and so they all had it. Yeah, so when they would come. The hooker squad. It said hooker squad on the front. That's hooker right. squad. Yeah. Hooker that's squad. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was cool, man. And it's like those, it's making those memories or whatever. And for Waycross, like that's sort of few and far between or whatever. And like, I think that that place used to be the Green Frog, right? Yeah, uh, directly <laughs> uh, behind behind it or in front of it, however you want to. Yeah, was it, look it was at Lulu's it. That building, bait shack uh, one time or something. That built <coughs> the building on uh, Lee Avenue that exists there now. It's called LBT uh, uh, Accounting or whatever it is. I thought that was the Green Frog. That's the actual yeah. Green Frog. And so was there also the Frog's Grog? There, the Frog's Grog was within the Green Frog on mm-hmm. the on the right-hand side of it. Okay. So, and uh, then in 1976 or 5, they opened up what was known as the lily pad. Yeah. Okay. Which was right there where the creek where sits the creek now. So it that's was, where I ate when I was a kid. Yeah. So I always thought that I ate at the green frog proper, but it was really the lily pad. The lily pad. Yeah. And so at the time, though, they were sort of bringing over the sort of green frog stuff or whatever. So they had frog legs All on the part of the green frog. Yeah. It was because named the lily pad so i remember eating there as a kid just mm. barely though you know and uh it was and i had a very I, outdoorsy place yeah, with yeah, rocks, like screen doors rocks kinda, in, yeah. the, in, in the courtyard and stone picnic tables and little stage but it was for still the left over from green frog mm. and was it still darden at that point was he still part of that or had they just sort of Capitalized I'm off not that. A, I'm not sure about the dates by then. Okay. I've got a I've got a, a blog on that uh that I'd have to refer okay. to to get the dates and everything. But uh the Dardens were the original Still, Green yeah, Frog. Yeah, yeah. And, and they they spun out of that into Red Lobster and uh, Olive Garden, yeah, and I think they may have given one one or the other of those up. Maybe yeah, sold out of the franchise. Which a lot of people don't. And I don't mean, you realize, guys, yeah. you guys talk about it all the time, where there's like mm-hmm. something in the water, and there's all these sorts of creative mm-hmm. people around and stuff like that. It's like a lot of people don't know that like Red Lobster and all that sort of They're came from the Green Frog and started with yeah. Waycross. Jordan. Red yeah, Lobster's man. from Waycross. Yeah, man. Well, when so you look little, at it, like so, <laughs> so them little biscuits is from Waycross. That's right. And what's so funny is they actually built a Red Lobster here, right, <laughs> with the Olive Garden, right? right? And then after like maybe five years, I think, which I went to it all the time. It's like, yeah. awesome, Red Lobster. I got the biscuits and stuff. Yeah. And they're like, it's not working. It's so not they working. closed the Red Lobster <laughs> down. What? It started. Like, but big, they left the Olive Garden, though. There was a big plaque outside, too. This the was Dardens. originally. Right. And uh, it's like, you well, know, how, sometimes how it works. people it, forget. It, it, Zach, <laughs> Zaxby's from here, too, isn't it? Zaxby's mm. is or is Atlanta or something. Sure Zaxby's, Zaxby's, Zaxby's Chansley no, or something. I've never heard about that. But <laughs> we, were, we were one of the first and only Maryland fried chickens in Georgia. Yeah, that, yeah. That came here in 69 when I was in 69. high school. 
We went. Uh, this is totally out in left field, but I'm, I'm an army rat, and we moved around a lot. And <clears throat> I lived in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and they had we. That's where the first putt putt was. First putt. Fayetteville. Yeah, yeah, the, Did it, you play it? Is it still? Oh yeah, there? yeah, it's still there. Oh uh, yeah. But it's like you, you, y'all were talking about the Red Lobster got ran out of town. <laughs> <laughs> There's still putt button today, but, <laughs> and it uh, they didn't like update it or nothing. It's like this. It's Love like it. walking back in, into a different decade. <laughs> Almost, as, I don't know how old's but but. I don't know. Maybe and we should ask Gargamel. Put, put golf has been <laughs> been around as long as I have. I know. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, we were talking a little earlier about uh, Sean possibly picking up some cactus crud on our trip across uh, to California. And speaking of California, that's where you resided. I did. For about 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. Los Angeles. That's right. Ooh, yeah, man. Yeah, it was fun that. at the time, you know. It was yeah. like, you know, wouldn't want to be there now, but, what, you know, what, at the time. What years were you out there? <laughs> so I got there in 1999, and I stayed until about 2009. Um, yeah, I drove out there by myself. Your recent sort of expedition reminded me of when I drove yeah, out. Yeah. I also broke down. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I took my um, Honda Civic and put it in a U-Haul and put all my shit in a U-Haul and drove from Atlanta to L.A. and uh, broke down right around Barstow, I think. might have been a Lodi somewhere around there. Texas. Stuck in Lodi again. Stuck is, in Lodi. Where is Lodi? It's right in California. California. And okay. you, so you got sort it all of, the way there. I got to California right where um it got it got sketchy, you know, yeah. right as I because I'm by myself and it's right when cell phones had come out too. So I actually had a flip phone with me for emergencies right. when you used to just keep it off. You just have it there. Yeah for you, you know? The good old days. So I had it, <laughs> yeah. you know? And luckily I had it because I did actually, like, the tire on my trailer, the U-Haul trailer that was pulling the car, <clears throat> it was actually inside, so the car dro- I drove the car inside the trailer. Mm-hmm. And then right as I got into California, bam, the tire blows out. Oh. I thought, shit. And I call, I start to call, and then right as the time, I mean, before I even get AAA, a guy comes by, a trucker or whatever, he's like, you need help or whatever? I'm like, I don't, I called AAA, but I was like, man, already. I'm like, I mean, in California, I'm like, already they're acting nice to me, you know? I was like, that's awesome. Either he's here to, you know, abduct me and, and take me away, <laughs> or he was an actually nice guy, so I just chose nice guy. And then, uh, and then, so eventually, the AAA guy comes. I get into the city and stuff like that. But I had, I had gone there because my, you know, I'd sort of always thought that I would go out there. But once I had left Waycross, what I did was I went up north and I went to college and I went to Emerson College. Mm-hmm. And but I went to film school, so. My eventual destination was going to be California. I sort of knew that or whatever. Right. They were talking about Florida at the time, but I sort of knew it would be California. And uh, I got out to California because I had friends that had been in, um, you know, in Boston that I knew at Emerson and stuff that were filmmakers and friends of mine and creative people, artists and stuff mm-hmm. that – that sort of were like, you should just come out here and it'll be it'll be fun or whatever. We'll be fine. So I did and uh, got out there and, you know, I kind of, I didn't really have a job at that point, but I had sort of grown up around music and I'd sort of been like that sort of little filmmaker guy with the video camera and stuff mm-hmm. like that as I was a kid and stuff. And then once I got there, I... Sort of just, it was the time of uh, when people were just starting to put their resumes online and stuff, like when they were just starting to get into the internet. And uh, and I was already, you know, I'd come from Atlanta, but I already, already knew the internet was something. So I'd already started to sort of teach myself to code and stuff like that. Right. So I was totally into it. So I had a little bit of stuff to show or whatever, you know. 
So once I got to LA, I kind of immediately just got a job with like a dot com. Like it was like that time, you know, it was like 1999. There were all these little dot coms popping up and stuff. And so they just grabbed me up and I had like my friend's movie that I was doing the website for that, you know, because he was my friend in college. And then I had, I remember I had flash at the time was like the big like thing. It was like macromedia flash. And it was this, this program that kind of allowed you to (laughs) just sort of animate and just sort of do all this stuff that the web hadn't seen before, before it was that it was just sort of text and stuff. And so I had made, I did the movie website which was kind of cool, you know, it was a sort of a show piece, but I'd also done this sort of piece from, from Flash that was this animated album cover of, um, <laughs> who's the crooner? Um, Older. The crooner, Blue Eyes. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Yeah, yeah. So it was like his old, like, 50s album. I can't remember what album it was, but. It was, you know, the classic sort of, so I had just made this animated piece. And so that really, so all of a sudden, you know, I put my, once I got to LA, I put my resume online and I put that piece online and I put the, the movie, my friend's movie Mm -hmm. piece online and then bam, here comes Sony music, you know, whoever Uh it was, you know, the girl who hired me, my boss, eventually, you know, she was into the internet too, and she was working for you know, Epic Records, Sony Music. And so she had, she'd been one of those ones that was combing, you know, the actual online resumes and stuff. And again, nobody was doing that at this point. So I was probably like, I don't know what number I was, but it was probably like 500 of people that had put their resume on Monster, you know. And, uh, and they saw it, and I remember them being like, really, like being like that Frank Sinatra thing, you know? Yeah, we love that, you know. And all it was was a kind of a simple, you know, just an animation it. of it, of the album cover. You know, I didn't do anything original or anything, but uh, I got hired for that, and uh, and it just seemed, again sort of seemed magical because I. I was not a musician, but I'd grown up with music, you know, and I I really was into music. Mm. I was into film too, but I was really into music. And so when they when they said, Hey, do you want to work for us? I was like, Oh my God, yes. You know, I was like, Lord for God. sure I do, you know. And so that's that's what I did. I you know, I went back, Yeah. And it was awesome and it was everything I ever you know, and then I went back and I was uh you know, looking at and I was like, Epic Records. I was like, I know Epic Records. Oh, you know, I've had oh, Epic yeah. Records stuff. Yeah, and so yeah. I went through all my albums and stuff. I was like, which ones were Epic how long, Records? How long did you work for them? Ten years. Ten years. Ten years. Wow. Yeah. You were already, let's see, 18. Plus, uh, you graduated in high school in 1990. Supposed to be 89. But you were already 27. Yeah, I got in there just when I was under 30 years old, which was good. You know, that's, you know, once you, because even, so the people that hired me, because it was just the online, you know, this was a new thing, the internet, you know, so it was like, you know, the the, age wouldn't have mattered. That's right. And they were actually, the people that hired me, the girl that found my resume, so she was actually younger than me. So, Mm -hmm. like, there was only one other, it was a five man woman team. The bosses were actually women, um, and you know, t- three of them were younger than me. So there was only one other person that was like a little bit older than me. You know, so and then compared to the other people at Sony, we were really young. You know, mm-hmm. besides the A and R people, you know, it's like the A and R people are different. But like all the executives and stuff, I remember. Even just being in the, um, I remember being in the interview because the interview process was super long too. It mm. was like, if you ever like try to get it, like telling kids these days, like if you're trying to get a job, like hold out, you know, because it's like doesn't happen like just like that. Because like I remember there was like so many callbacks. It was like being on like a, a show or something mm. where it was like, okay, now we have to run it through these people. Now we have to run it through these people or whatever, you know. So it was just extremely long. Mm-hmm. So when they, you know, when they eventually hired me, I was you know, relieved or whatever. Yeah. You remember the first job they put you on? I do. It was for Jennifer Lopez. Wow. J Lo, before she was J Lo, <laughs> but just before, and it was reading all of the emails that came in 
to Jennifer Lopez. So it was not just fan mail. You're talking about business, everybody, business offers, whatever. all of it, well, because probably, that was the beginning. Some juicy stuff. <laughs> for sure. So it was the beginning of nobody even had an email at that point, really. You know right, what I mean? It was right. the beginning was, of that. You yeah. know, if you had an email, you were like in the know kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so then they just made a website for Jennifer Lopez, and it was before J Lo, so she wasn't quite that big yet, but she was Jennifer Lopez. So they had jenniferlopez.com and they had. Jennifer Lopez at jenniferlopez.com that anybody could kind of email to her. You know, mm-hmm. it was before social media and all that stuff. Yeah. And so they were like, here's, they're like, you have the Jennifer Lopez email That's inbox. That's crazy. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and it was lit. it was the wildest shit. It was the crate, it was from, um, I love you to death to, um, you should be doing it. The amazing thing was, um, the people that were mad that she wasn't giving more because she was had money, and so she should be doing more for people and be uh, giving more money, and you should be oh doing Lord. more charity. And then there was just the, um, you know, the ones that we just sent to the FBI. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. People emailing you thinking Pretty you were much. general J Lo. You could have yeah. been emailing them back, and yeah. I, I would be tempted to mess with them. Right? Did you have to answer them? Were no you, answering. Just you passing, just, had to just, just sifting, kind of sifting, just and sifting calling. through. And yeah. that didn't last for very long because eventually they were like, "We really can't be just giving musicians email addresses and doing fan mail like this. Right. This is not going to work." Mm-hmm. One of the, <laughs> now uh, imagine how different your first week of. <laughs> Your Sony gig would have been if it had been now instead of back then. It would have been like way Can you like imagine people what sending a- AI videos oh, yeah, to J Lo. <laughs> For sure. Like it's just completely out of control now. Yeah, but that was the beginning of it and already the the craziness was starting to sort of poke through, you know. <clears throat> so as as we all know how quickly uh the uh things change, what is state of the art in 1999, quick, quickly became obsolete by uh, 2001, probably. Uh, For sure. How did your How did your uh, job change there over that 10 years? Yeah, you find I yourself mean, yourself in more uh, 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 incredible circumstances. For sure. I mean, right around. So I get the job around two. 1999, mm-hmm. I worked through 2000, I'm in a cubicle, you know, and uh, at some point, I think, you know, I was in the Santa Monica office, which is like this awesome little building over by the beach, and mm-hmm. it's so low-key, it's so like just chill, mm-hmm. and then the real office of Sony Music is this huge skyscraper in New York City, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't know that that was, you know, I I mean, of course I I sort of knew, but I didn't know that that was going to be sort of part of my job. But what it would end up being is like I would have to, everybody would have to, you know, pay their dues to New York and go to New York for conferences and mm-hmm. meetings and stuff like that and we would always be in touch with New York and New York was the bosses were really there you know Tommy Matola was there at the time when I started um and so you know what ended up happening was you know the first my first trip to New York I I you know is in 2001 it's in August of 2001 and I don't really want to go. <laughs> I have this sort of bad feeling or whatever. And I tell my friends that I don't really want to go. It's actually Jamie Papello and Caroline Williams, which she's from Waycross too. She's Jack Williams' uh, daughter. Mm. And uh, I tell she's visiting L.A. Jamie lives in L.A. He's from Waycross as well. And I tell them, I do not want to go to New York. I don't know why. I just have a bad feeling. I've flown all the time and stuff like that, but I just do not want to go. 
And I'm like, okay, well, it'll be okay, you know. So I go or whatever, and then I, I I meet my my sort of, you know, we had sort of co parts in you know sort of the job that I was doing in L.A. There was a guy who was doing that job in New York as well, and his name was Jay Lepis, and he was a great guy. And he, uh, I think he works in Nashville now. He's some big wig, big wig in mm-hmm. in Nashville, but he was fantastic, and. Uh, he got, you know, I was sort of, it was sort of like, I was sort of dumped off on him. It was like, here's your guy, you know, not really, but like, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, I'll, I'll show you around or whatever. And so he gets me tickets to Radiohead that night. It was like, we got in there on like a, a Friday and like we work all the way until like, you know, 6 or 7 p.m. And it's the grind of New York or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he, uh, you know, I got Radiohead tickets for you or whatever. We're going to go see them or whatever. I'm like, it's amazing, you know, meeting everybody in New York and stuff. And then in in New York, the offices in New York are like, it's like going into, you know, the, uh, you know, the hard rock or something because everybody in their office has like, you know, at one point I go into somebody's office, they're like, this is, you know, whatever, whoever executive or whatever I'm looking. And there's like, John Lennon handwritten lyrics, like, you know, <laughs> oh, wow. in a frame. I'm like, what? what is this? You know, so I'm just like, you know, I'm just totally blown away by it. But I don't like it at the same time. I'm very, it's very different from, from L.A. And, mm-hmm. and from Santa Monica. You know, Santa Monica, it's a beach. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we get there and he's like, okay, we work till 7 o'clock. And then you're like, okay, we're going to the show, you know. Let's go. And we're hustling. You know, it's like New York every time. You're just like hustling everywhere mm-hmm. you go. You're just like, oh, we got to go. We got to make the train. We got to do that. <laughs> and so we go. We're walking. We're walking. We're walking. You know, they're just, I, I don't know how long it is. You're like, where is it? You know, it's just down here. They're always like, it's just down the block. You know, it's like 16 blocks <laughs> later or whatever. And at some point, we're underneath something. And he's like, you know where we are, man? We're just hustling down. I'm like, what? Where? And it's just like, we're underneath the towers, man. There's the twin towers. I'm like, what? Wow. Oh shit! I'm like, oh my god! Boom! We hustle. We get on this ferry. We take the ferry across <clears throat> to Liberty Island, right? It's like New Jersey or something. Mm-hmm. As we come across, it's like Radiohead's playing Karma Police, like as the thing like sails up to the to the concert <laughs> or whatever. I get out. It's great you know it's so magical you know it's it's one it's one of those shows you know it's like one of those shows where you're like once in a lifetime thing or whatever and you're just like and so then you know and the statue of liberty like it's this beautiful thing you see the city here statue of liberty radiohead karma police and it's like this is amazing we watch the rest of the show and stuff and then you know again i told my friends i don't even want to go to new york i have this bad feeling i don't know what it is and then eventually, like me and Jay are still hanging out. I've been to that show and stuff. I'm like, I don't my my other the girl who hired me, April, Denise, Tim, everybody's going back to to Santa Monica. I'm like, I don't want to go. I don't want to get on the plane. So I just stay. I just sleep with in the I just go to Brooklyn with Jay. I'm like, just I just want to just sleep here. I don't want to take the plane. I'll just take the plane later. I don't know what it is. Mm. And then uh, you know. Everything's fine. Next day, get the you know get the plane home. Everybody you know everybody's back in L.A. What's wrong with you? You know stuff like that. And then like literally a month later, nine eleven. One know? month later. Yeah, that's crazy. I, like, I figured nine oh, no. eleven was coming. <laughs> so yeah, I it was magical and weird at the same time. And that was sort of like that really was like at the very beginning of like my Sony. Thing and my New York thing too. I'd been to New York before, but that time was really different. And and then after that happened, because we had all these like contacts in New York, you know, it was just like Check devastating it. at that mm-hmm. point. You know, it was just like. And then it was also like I noticed like with the, with the you know the artists and stuff like right after nine eleven and stuff. There were a bunch of like music videos and stuff that we were like you know, into and just art in general, you know, just sort of got like basically like self-censored because of that act or whatever, because everybody was sort of like in this sort of like, like just hated like just death and destruction so much. So any sort of 
bands that had anything that had to do with that, which is like every band in the yeah, world, yeah. basically, you know, they had to be like, hold back on that. And there had to be like, things had to stop for that or whatever, just because of that. And it really was like sort of self, like it was self-imposed. It wasn't like the government was coming in and being like, you can't do that. It was more like people were like, oh, yeah. we can't do that because of that. I remember yeah. the yeah. Ryan Adams, the, uh, gold album with new york new york the song yeah he he filmed a video like i think september 7th and he had he's standing at the bridge with the towers in the background but they he he went and didn't he didn't release it for a long time because he was like this is kind of creepy it makes yeah. it sound like i'm singing about what happened right. and i'm just singing about how crazy new york right is. everybody mm -hmm. was like really messed up at that time and and that was, it kind of sucked because for me or whatever, it was like, that was the beginning of my sort of career or whatever. I remember mm -hmm. like, you know, I had a job before Sony in, you know, in LA as like a web person. But then once I had sort of gotten to Sony, I was like, okay, this is a real thing or whatever, you know. And then when that happened, it sort of like put a dent in everything a little bit, you know? And I think it did that for a lot of people too. So I know that like, it wasn't just me. It was like everybody basically like felt this like <clears throat> thing or whatever. Even if you weren't in New York, you know, it was just like this thing that was like hanging over your head or whatever. So that like happened right away or whatever. And it was like, you know, again, a big, a big deal, but mm -hmm. That wasn't the, you know, that was just the beginning or whatever. But that show itself, the Radiohead show, because of that and because of walking under the towers on the way and him mm. being like, hey, you know where we are? It was one yeah. of those shows where yeah. I was like, okay, that's solidified. Like, yeah. that's going to be forever ingrained, you that's know? That's right. Yeah. And there's a couple of shows that are like that, you know? It's like there's a couple of, there's... For everybody, I think yeah. it's oh, yeah. like some big stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just like everybody in my generation knows exactly where they were the day Kennedy was assassinated, you know. And uh, we were just kids, you know. But boy, it was <laughs> that pretty much plants it right there, you know. Challenger was another one. The Challenger yeah. explosion, I can remember just. Watching that in real time, I was always a space buff, you know, and then just to be able to sit in there and watching it and knowing deep down inside that something ain't right, you know, and to just feel the, you can just feel the loss, you know, you just through the television set, you can just, it's almost sickening, you know, that just the, the monumental loss uh, that happens it just sucks the air out of you, you know. And I was just listening to a, a couple of 911 calls, you know, uh, on YouTube. I blew it. <clears throat> it was just yesterday. And uh, how horrific. I mean, these people were just pleading, you know. Can't you do something? You know, yeah. my God! And then and and, and had this uh, this picture alongside of the moment that it just collapsed all the way to the ground, and which was right in sync with his last words. You know, it was like, oh God, yeah, what? It? You know, and then silence. Yeah, yeah when 9 11 happened, I was in a classroom full of students, and this kid came in and said, Turn on the TV. And we saw right about right before the second plane flew in, but you could see people jumping. Oh, man. That's... Like it was just crazy. Yeah, and yeah. And like, they still have pictures of that. And so, too. like, I was yeah. trying to keep everybody calm and trying not to freak out at the same time. And yeah. And I still have kids that were with me that day that will be like, man, I'm so glad I was with you that day. And Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, it was actually important, like, sort of who you were with that day and sort of who you contacted that day and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, that was a huge deal because I remember me not sort of 
being out there by myself and not having family and stuff. And, and I remember early, early in the morning, one of my colleagues from work who had been in New York, who had taken the flight back that month before being like ringing me like super early, like waking me up and being like, are you seeing what's happening? Mm. And being like, is this what you were talking about? Is this what you were scared about? You have to call me back. You know? Oh, yeah. Did you know anybody who was hurt from it? Or? I didn't. I didn't know anybody personally who, who, who died and, and nobody like the people at, you know, nobody at Sony or anything did, you know, they were super effective, <clears throat> but I didn't know anybody directly that mm. that died in that building or anything i remember being the very first time i was in the sony building because it's one of the tallest buildings i think it's the, like seventh most tallest building in new york i remember being up in the very top of the building and looking down and they were the person who was sort of showing us around for the first time was like just so you guys know this is the third most targeted building of all oh, terrorism wow. and you know that was before now so i was just like what are y'all talking about you know just yeah, like, what you even, heard of building yeah what terrorists building? what mm, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah so it, you know it, and and so because of that though is almost like i never really wanted to go to new york again you know it was almost like i would be good if i never you know, sort of set foot in that place again. I mm. did go again after that and stuff and even for work, but I was always, you know, it was always just different and it was way different from being in the Santa Monica office oh, of Sony, yeah. you know, just the whole, the work ethic, the, the environment, everything was just completely different, you know? And so not to like, too late, but like, you know, that wasn't like a huge part of my life, but I do definitely remember like that being like one of those shows where I was like, man, this is, you know, this is mm -hmm. like, and even at the time I was like, this is kind of surreal with the <laughs> karma police and the, <laughs> the statue of Liberty and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah. That, that was a heck of a, heck of a story. <laughs> Um, well, let's, let's, uh, get back to, uh, now let's move to back to California and earthquakes. No. Yeah. <laughs> and other natural disasters. Uh, did you ever go through an earthquake out there? Did I, you, you know, ever? every now and then there'd be something, but no little, major ones never, never happen. A little rumble every now and then, nothing yeah. that knocks stuff down in our, you know, in, in our offices and stuff, everything was completely bolted to the wall. I think even the building in Santa Monica, the Sony building was built on those, um, you know, once there was a certain uh, year, they sort of built everything on these sort of rolling things so yeah. that they could never accommodated so uh, yep. movement like that. Yep. Yeah, if it shaked, it wouldn't mm -hmm. just crumble the whole building. It would mm -hmm. actually sort of wobble to the side. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, that was, everything was all good there. All, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so, uh, besides J-Lo, <laughs> did you have any other names of notoriety that, uh, now what, you, you said your, your, your title was, uh, Basically, uh, it was associated with the internet as, as marketing, yeah, more than anything. Yeah, I was in the um, it was marketing and online, it was a called a content manager, mm -hmm. it really just meant that I sort of oversaw the websites and uh, you know, the artist websites and the, the label website, epicrecords.com, and so it's promotion. It uh, is. It was all promote. Of course, it's you know, it's uh, you know, it's doing. So it would run just constant contests. It would be news about the band. We would, you know, as the internet was getting more and more sort of involved, it would be, you know, video stuff, mm -hmm. music files. Social media was just starting off, so it's just MySpace at that point. So <laughs> good old MySpace. So we jumped on MySpace immediately. So I had to control all of the MySpace accounts too. So now you've got something where it's going all the 
websites for the artists because what it would be was every now and then an artist would have their own website and they would have garnered their own they would have known what was going on and we would desperately try to get that website you know we would want to take control of that website and most of the time we would every now and then they would keep control of their website but most of the time we would get their website and we would do every time there was an album cycle we would make sure that you know that was happening and then myspace came along and we needed to have a MySpace for every artist as well, not just the website, but the MySpace as well. And mm -hmm. so at one point, we, my boss was like, we've got to hire an army of interns, right? So, I'm like, okay, he's like, I'm putting you in charge of that. Okay, so we hire like just tons of fresh out of college, <clears throat> um, or no, the in MySpace college, army. <laughs> in college kids for the myspace army to handle the myspace because it really was too much i mean if you think about it it would be like you know we were just handling the website at first me i was handling the website and now you've got to be like this daily basis kind of thing and pretend mm -hmm. like you're the person or whatever and mm -hmm. like i was just like this is unattained you, know, you can't do this so like, okay we'll hire a bunch of interns we won't pay them and it'll be great <laughs> And so I, we do. We hire this army of interns, and we outside of my office is a bunch of cubicles where we're going to set these interns up. And somehow the New York Times, I think, gets a hold of that we're hiring a bunch of people, and they publish this horrible article about how Sony Music is hiring all these people, and they're not paying them, and they're uh. doing them on social media and all this stuff. So that was kind of crazy. And then... One of my interns was from Waycross. Her name's Nikki Deloach. Do you know who that is? Is that, uh, <laughs> uh, wait a minute. Is that, um, uh, uh, Deloach? Wait a minute. No. That sounds familiar. <laughs> So she is an actress. Yeah, she was the actress. Uh, <laughs> she was also in music groups um, yeah, uh, before this. She's Disney, actually from Blackshare. Wasn't, wasn't it Disney that she was involved she in? She was part yeah. of the Mouseketeers as well during yeah, the time of... That's right. Of, uh, and so she Britney was... Spears was Brit so it was her and Britney her. Spears. I think I saw her, a picture of her at Justin Long's Timberlake. Palace. Yes. So that's when that's, you made it. You're on the wall at Long's that's Palace. That's Nikki Deloach. <laughs> And she that? was an intern for me because at the time she had just gotten finished with her, um, her mu she was in this this girl group called Innocence that was by the same guy who had done New Kids on the Block, I think, or either the one that Justin Timberlake was in, and he later like went to jail, I think. Um, and so she had gotten like completely screwed out yeah. of stuff and like just like had a horrible experience with that. And so she was back in college at Santa Monica College and needed to like finish out her degree. And so she was one of the interns and yeah. she was awesome and she was so cool. And now she's become like if you watch like Hallmark movies or whatever, like She's like a writer, director, producer on that stuff or whatever. Don't like come she's a huge thing. <laughs> oh yeah, she's Has she, she knows her. <laughs> she doesn't act. She does. She does yeah. it all. Okay. She looks like um, a she looks like a Hallmark actress. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> I mean that I in a nice like, way. Yeah, for sure. For and like, you know, and part of the music industry too, but like in like you know, the craziest way, like she, you know, she had been through all of that stuff before and then sort of was just like finishing out her degree or whatever. And so that was just like one of those things where it was like the middle of like right in the middle of Sony or whatever. Here's a white cross person right in the middle of it. <laughs> sort of really Pierce County, but now, now, well, you, now you could hire bots to do all the MySpace. <laughs> exactly. Hey, I bought. Exactly. Who was the one that Sean dated? Justin. He, she was from. Uh, Sean dated. Th I think she was from Pierce County, and she she was in Anaconda. What was that Sean, girl's name? Sean, Sean, Sean dated followed somebody from Anaconda. From Anaconda is J Lo, I think. No, I think it was one of the follow-ups. One of the sequels. Oh, uh, okay. Well, anyhow. I can't she, remember her name. Oh man, it wasn't Nikki Deloach. It was not that. Now, uh, uh, 
Uh, we should call him. <laughs> Can I phone a friend? Can I phone a friend? <laughs> he can't talk on the phone right now. Though. He said, you call me for this. He says Anaconda. Sean, can I do a break? Real quick? Anaconda film cast. I like the way I like the way we're all watching the screen and nobody watching us and knowing what we're seeing. Justin, do you mind if I take a break? No. no. Okay, thanks. Sorry. What was her name? Carrie. There it is. Carrie. Back up again. Back up to that. Carrie. Walner. Oh, that's Carrie Wurr. No. That's the first Okay. I think that's the first one I'm trying to... Uh, I was thinking her name was Carrie. I forgot j was in Anaconda. That was the original. Um, Katie. It was Katie... Strickland. Strickland. Is that right? Yeah, Katie that's Strickland. a Brantley County name. Oh, that's a South Georgia name. Is that Katie Strickland right there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is she related to Laney? <laughs> no, I believe she was from a uh, Patterson. Born in Patterson. Okay. I thought you said L. Patterson. It's like uh, out in the West Texas town of L. L. Patterson. I guess it's uh, the no, east. Uh, Sean, she, they both graduated about the same time, and she moved up to Philadelphia to go to film school, I guess. And uh, well, That's awesome. I didn't name know Waycross Katie had. Strickland. Way across there is something in the water down here now. She was. We got epic born records. In, uh, Hallmark movies. 75. Girl groups. <laughs> Anaconda movies. That's who. A bunch of washed up hookers. Her I love it. Her and Sean Clark were Not, thick as thieves. I love it. <laughs> and Something uh, in the water. Great song. You know the first show I. So. You know the first show I went to, right? Oh, dear. Uh, they, first uh, what show? What kind of show? Concert. First concert yeah. no, that you ever went to. What was I it? I think Who you were that? there. Was I? Did you uh, pay, play with the Dave Middleton band? Eddie Middleton. Eddie Middleton. You came to the Down Home with Eddie Middleton show? Valdosta? Yeah. And what year I were think you born? I, I was born in 72, but in 75. Oh, yeah. Well, it could have, if it happened between 75 and 78, that would have been. That you were been, with Bruce Wood playing, right? Oh, it would have been when Bruce was there. Yeah. Was that and the he right? he was there in 75. From so October I believe to, that I was at a show in 75. This is from my recollection. Mm-hmm. And I you, think that I got up on stage three. and sang Love Will Keep Us Together <laughs> by Captain and Tennille. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> but, uh, All right, I, I want to do I want a reenactment duet right did now. Happen. <laughs> you y'all two need to do the do love. Da, da, da. love will keep us together. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. That's like one of my earliest memories. Oh my god. Yeah, man. It would have had to have been the King of the Road. King of the Road. It would have been the King of the Road. Yeah, man. We so you've done some shows on that one too? Like some reminiscent on the King of the Road shows? We had uh yeah, John Smith on here. Okay. Uh who was our uh drummer in yeah, that John's band awesome. from June of seventy six through Probably about uh, November, December of uh, 77. He he left the group to form uh, Homeward Angel, a band, with his brother Bill Smith and Bill Ferris on bass. And then Ricky Alderman was in our band, too, and he left uh, about January or February of 78 to join their band. And they went on, it was Homeward Angel. No, it was Shadowfax. That was who they named themselves first. That was the, uh, what's his name's horse in, in uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, Shadowfax? What's the old gray wizard? What was his Gandalf. name? Gandalf, Gandalf's horse, <laughs> Shadowfax. <laughs> he 
He was the one that said, Hi, old silver. No, that was wrong. <laughs> <one. laughs> no. Uh, and then they changed their name to Homeward Angel, which is uh, from that. But what? It's. Poem. So Eddie Middleton, right? But Eddie the band was, was named what? Down Home. Down Home Band, right, right. Down home and Bruce Wood was in that, right? Of course, right? When, we, when we first went with him in 75, it was Bruce on drums. Okay. Me on guitar, Joe Shear on guitar, Wayne Scarborough on bass, and Ricky on keyboard. Okay. And we were homegrown as we left Waycross and joined him in Valdosta, where we immediately rose in stature because we had Monday through Saturday gigs, money. Man, and y'all were making went bank. Up. And y'all were doing it. And uh, like for three years you for did this, three right? three years, it was life Man, on the road, were... boy. It was my dream come true, and it was my education, too, well, at the same awesome, time. Right? You got any recordings <laughs> from back then? Uh, yeah, we do. I, I got it, some I, I got some CDs. <laughs> There's a, we also dressed in matching outfits, as and you can tell you look, by that. You look like Kenny Loggins. <laughs> it's like five Kenny Loggins. <laughs> So yeah, if you can find the thing where the three year old those, sings, uh, as, as that you on the end? Was... <laughs> on the right, yeah, yeah, it was that's like, me, it was Joe like Shear, Wayne Scarborough, John Smith, and Ricky Alderman. All, and you're the all five of us from Waycross. Is and that John with the little stash? But then Eddie yeah. Middleton is the lead guy, and he you guys the, are backing he him was up. The front man, and then but he doesn't have that outfit on. No, just no. Y'all. he always he's like in a three piece seventies. He's always in a seventies <laughs> yeah. uh, damn yeah. Tom Jones tuxedo yes. or what have you. Yes. Now uh, you need to rock that outfit now, man. Uh, I that don't have those back. anymore. And uh, as Look Ricky, as Ricky on the far left would always say. Man, these things are too tight. <laughs> he said, they're hurting my gonads, man. <laughs> Holy shit. We wound up buying those out of uh, the Macon Mall is where we found those. <laughs> What's that movie where Cheech and Chong, where they're having band practice and they're having dress <laughs> rehearsal and they're all wearing them crazy outfits? Oh, we had names for all. John's of our like, "Hey, wearing these, man." <laughs> of course, those were the overalls. <laughs> Wayne would call us about two o'clock every day. We'd be waking up at about two or three o'clock. No, he'd call us later than that. Uh, we usually we'd go downstairs at King of the Road and have uh, they had a restaurant down there, so we'd eat the buffet. Then we'd <laughs> just do whatever we wanted to for the rest of the afternoon unless we had a rehearsal plan. Then around 6 o'clock, the dinner set started about 8.30. Oh, that was my. The king of the road right there. That's where you made your singing debut right there. On it that was day. awesome, if too. pull up a picture of you about five I years old. I swear, if you find it, that would be awesome. I'm, yeah, that looks I'm, like, I'm surprised your mama didn't snap a photo of that. No, you know, she we, did, and we know, looked for it, but oh, we couldn't I'm find saying. it. You look like the the guy who was in the Blues Brothers, but then like you know when they went to stage well, when they put the band back together. Like, yeah, yeah, it looks like those were the Peach Pants. That's what we call those <laughs> right there. See, we had nicknames for all of Wayne would call every day about six and say, "Look at them Les Pauls. Those are beautiful." <laughs> Wayne would say, "Wearing the pinstripes tonight. Those are the pinstripes, pinstripes. Peach Pants. Peach Pants. And he say <laughs> overalls, uh, blue and white." Uh, Blue and yellow, uh, uh, the jungle suits. <laughs> we you, had the jungle suits. Do you still have any of these guitars? <laughs> Hell oh, no. What I was gonna say, if you did, you need those are both Les Pauls. Yeah. Then right after that, they talked me in and said, "Man, why don't you trade your Les Paul for a Fender uh, Telecaster?" And that way, we'd have two distinct sounds on the guitars. That guitar is probably worth some money now. That's old. I bought that one. That cherry red uh, from uh, uh, World Hi-Fi in in the Waycross, uh, the Hatcher Point Mall. It's run by James Blunt back in the day. Bought Man, that we're guitar. Full of knowledge today. I like this. 1976. I bought that guitar. Yeah. 
Yeah, boy. Now that was at the the Man of War in Chattanooga. That particular backdrop, I recognize that. That was the Man of War Lounge in Chattanooga. <laughs> I have stories for all these pictures, but it's it's only a short episode. (laughs) (laughs) Oh boy, that's neat though that you you actually got there, man, and and sang with us. I imagine they just propped you right up there. They did because we we probably didn't back you up or anything because we didn't know the song. You just get up there and said, "Love, yeah." (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I was like, all right, done. Yeah, boy. You remember the chairs in that place? Uh, not that place, but the King of the Road. I mean, I just have a, a, a sort of a, you know, a, a recollection of sort of just looking out and yeah. seeing people, you know, and just being like, wow. It was, it was because we were, I think we had come into town because Bruce was playing, yeah. you know, and, and again, Lee Lane and, and my mom and stuff, and we had come in from South Carolina. and There it is. That's what you saw from the stage. And, and oh, wow. King of the that's, Road is still there, right? It it's still badass. it's yes. still there. And is all that, of that the, is the still, still there. It's the just still that they don't there? they don't they don't offer it up as a venue anymore. I mean, that anymore. looks like some it's mainly a convention Las center. Vegas now, this or is New standing York. on the stage. The stage was half moon, and then the room went out yeah, in yeah. larger circles. That's some Frank Sinatra so, looking crap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> from that's the lounge. half moon stage, which stood about this high off the ground. You had a, a oak parquet dance floor that was a semicircle. Then you had this lower level right outside the dance floor. You walk up three steps, you're on the second level. You see those uh, seashell black seats. Yeah, that's where you boots, wanted to be, the big man. Boots back there. Those yeah. went all the way around the back of the second level. You walk up three more steps, you're on the dining level. Yeah, that's that, balling uh, right there. Those two black doors in the back with what looks like a big screen TV. That was a uh, a window that there was a spotlight on the other side of that window. Yeah, the soundboard. And, uh, no, they didn't never use soundboards. Or but anything. it's just the spotlight shining to the stage. It's shown on the stage okay, okay. for the big acts. You know, we had uh, we shared the stage with uh, Sonny Turner, who was uh, uh, one of the lead singers for the Platters. And uh, let's see, uh, we shared the stage with uh, old Percy Sledge one time. Oh wow! Up in Macon, it was, it was cool. It, this was just this was uh, uh, my stomping ground. This was my love lives, my stomping grounds, my 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 home. You know, we we spent thirteen weeks from January. First through you're actually the middle in the, of March. Staying we in the motel. In right? the motel. They, so are they giving you VIP, VIP sort of? Yeah. A room where, for where every this? band member. Nice. I had my own room. That's a big deal. Where, was, was, where was this hotel? In Valdosta. Uh, Valdosta. Yeah, Valdosta. It's Valdosta. It's still there, right? It's, it's like a Best there. Western, right? It's a Best Western. Yeah, they bought it, I guess. Mm-hmm. It was always King of the originally, Road, but it's still called it was, King of the Road. Uh, originally, that was... Uh, um, uh, King of the Roger Miller's investment. Of the you know, yeah. he had a chain King of, of, of motor ends. And it really was related to that was related to the song. It yeah. was really oh. That was one of his investments. Wow. He said, How about let's uh, And then he got bought out by Best motel, Western. He's so. doing good. <laughs> hey, <laughs> and, uh, you were talking about singing with Dave when you were little. <laughs> my my brother in law Wayne, the guy who makes the CWC amps, and yeah, yeah. Wayne, he's got twin girls, and the same ones I was bragging on earlier about working out in Silicon Valley. Yeah, mm-hmm. they uh, Wayne was a big Kiss fan, well, we all were back in the oh, yeah. in the eighties, and uh, they went to a. I mean, Wayne was like collected pinball machines and Kiss memorabilia, yeah. and all this. but he he got tickets to see Kiss at some private Kiss Army kind of show, and he yeah. took his. Took the girls when they were little, like two or three, and of course little kids are gonna wander around. They they VIP they got VIP because they had these cute little kid twin <laughs> girls, and Gene and Paul pointing at them, inviting them over, and I think they got some pictures of them. Awesome. They didn't ever they didn't get on stage and sing a uh, love will keep us together or nothing. But, but close. But close. <laughs> <laughs> and probably luckily they didn't. 
No, but uh, you, you said that earlier. It made me think of that. <laughs> totally, man. Um, um, uh, Bruce's son was Chris. Yeah, right? and so and, I was, uh, y'all the same. Were y'all so the same? I was going to say he was there too. Yeah, Chris was there. He he is the same age. He's okay. exactly the same age. He's we were born two weeks apart, and that's Lee Lane's. That? That's Lee yeah. Lane's kid and mm-hmm. Bruce's, and. Uh, he was there that night too, because Lee Lane was there. You know, it was Lee Lane, my mom. Bruce was there, and uh, and they try to get. This is what my mom, how my mom tells it, is that they would, they try to get Chris to get up there and sing too, but he wouldn't do it. And so I was like, I'll take, I'll take it, I'll take it, because I love Captain and Tennille. So I think. Uh, oh man, you, y'all were. The, you said you were the kings of the road, but King you were road. basically staying in the same place. You didn't use the road. You used the. The it, hotel hallways. It, it, it was our home, uh, uh, home away from the road. Home uh, on the that's road. That's awesome. We did travel a lot back in those years, those three years, but we would always come back. That was kind of where we based out of was the king of the road, you know, and uh, and that's where all you know the Waycross is an hour away, so we had a lot of friends. Our wives would be able to come, you know, and girlfriends, if, and and but not at the same time, right? Exactly. Now I Did tried it? that, but it didn't work real well. No, as a matter of fact, I got away with it. You like- I wasn't married at that time, but uh, uh, it was uh, an exceptional time to be uh, young and in music. <laughs> it was good times. Well, let's uh, discuss another dun, element dun, dun. of. Uh, um, what I learned from your mama uh, that uh, you were uh, imp- very much impressed by Graham Parsons, the story of Graham Parsons. Yeah, for sure. Uh, how did you, uh, how were you introduced to that? Was that when you were out there or did you n- know inklings about it before you left to go to California when you were here in Waycross? It was actually even before that. So yeah. I w- so graduated from Ware County and went to Emerson College. Mm-hmm. Nineteen ni- graduated in nineteen ninety. So was in college in nineteen ninety as well. It's a liberal arts school. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the people in my class at the time were Bill Burr, um, Paul Thomas Anderson was Bill there. Bill Burr, yeah, the Attorney General. No, that's Bill Barr. No, <laughs> no Bill Burr is a comedian. Yeah, yeah Bill Burr is the guy with a... <laughs> All right, but, folks. <laughs> if it had been Bill Barr... <laughs> it, it it'd been a hell of a lot funnier. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Burr is that guy that's like really like, well, what I'm saying is, why? He's like... I got you. He's I a red. Know, he's a redheaded exactly comedian. He he's pretty yeah. funny. He's anti woke. So he's actually pretty hot now. Um, yeah. At the time, you know, I didn't know who he was. Um, and Paul Thomas Anderson was there at the mm-hmm. time I was there. Um, so, but it was 1990, and uh, fi- went to film school. Wanted to be a, you know, or a, you know. Want to be Steven Spielberg or whatever? You're, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, just a regular old Steven Spielberg. <laughs> um, they were talking in a Jewish accent for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but so I go to Emerson College and first year, man. So I'm from White Cross, Georgia. I go to Boston, Massachusetts because I want to get out of White Cross, Georgia, the little town, the sleepy town that doesn't have anything. There's no internet. There's no, I can't get the latest music. I can't get the latest books, nothing. So I go to Boston and the first professor I meet for like some basic like 101 English class or whatever is he had something where like you, you know, it's the first class and he's like, you know, I just want you guys to just write your, you know, write a little bit about yourself and then come up and talk to me. And I just want to get to know you for a second, you know, so it's like a class of like 20 people or whatever. <laughs> and I walk up, he's like, okay, hey, Jim, where are you from? And I'm like, way across Georgia. You've never heard of me. He's like, Graham Parsons. Uh, and that's 1990. Just, yeah. And so I'm kind of like, I. Um, I have heard the name, but I don't know really who he's yeah. talking about, you know. So I'm just like, yeah, yeah. And so immediately I, like, 
you know, I come back home that next Christmas or whatever, and I'm like, there's a guy who knew who where Waycross was because of Graham Parsons or whatever, and I tell my parents that, and they kind of are, just don't know. You know, they're mm-hmm. just kind of like, eh, kind of, and I think my mom was like, I think one time there was some artist who wanted to donate a bust or a statue or a plaque or something, and he couldn't get it donated, so he came to the garden club and wanted to donate something about Graham Parsons. And I'm like, well, who is this guy? Like, why, you know, what? why doesn't anybody know about this? Like, what is going Mm -hmm. on? You know, so I started to do research. And again, it's before, you know, the Internet proper. I mean, even though there's – and internet in 1990, right? There's, it's like it doesn't matter because nobody's on there. Like nobody's Ooh, putting yeah. any information on there. So like it's like scientific stuff's on there at that mm-hmm. point. There's no like history of rock and roll or anything. So you know, I'm it's still trying to find stuff. She tells me that part about how there's this, you know, there was this artist. I don't know if you've ever heard. It was Ray. Like, who? Who? Billy Ray. It. That's. So no, did he? Billy Ray did he actually mold a bus? No, or he, he didn't. What was he, it? He just solicited uh, the garden club for a. Po- I didn't think it was that. Far, was it a plaque far ago, or something? But it may have been. Yeah, and it would have to been him. He said that, that he had tried to other than me and him. Well, and that's what for I years you know before, and years. You know, you I know. asked her. I said, "Do you remember that story?" And who was that? She said, "I don't know." She tried to call Michael James and. You know, yeah. it was just you know, nobody knew, but it, mm. maybe it was. I, you know, the way she describes it was, and also in ninety one was the year that the Chamber of Commerce attached a Grand Parsons tribute concert to the annual Pogo Fest. That was okay. ninety one. Okay, that was October of ninety one. Okay. When the Braves went to the World Series, and it's when it's when the first biography comes out of him too, right? Right, that's, right. That's the Hickory uh, Wing Hickory was the same right? year. Okay, exactly. So, and so it was all kind of coming to a head right exactly. in there. So that must have really piqued your curiosity. Oh, for sure. And so then you know, I was what is you know why is nobody talking about this? What mm. who is this guy or whatever? You know, then you know birds. Burrito Brothers, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, you can kind of piece that stuff together, but then it's more like, so I don't, I definitely didn't read the book in 91, but I probably read it in like 95, mm-hmm. maybe mid 90s, and was like, City, Waycross. City Auditorium, Elvis Presley played here. Like, <laughs> again, nobody told me about this, you know. Yeah. And I, you know, Burton had played basketball in that city <clears throat> auditorium. I had been in little theater and done acting classes and done theater in that auditorium and stuff. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever said, like, hey, you know, Elvis Presley played in this Jeez, place or whatever. It seems. <laughs> So right. like that wasn't so then, important, right? Like what? But once so now we're in the nineties. So mm. and now you know I read that account or whatever, mm. and I'm like, Graham Parsons was at the city auditorium, and you know I start doing more research. I think I start. I think I went to the library. Was actually doing like microfiche stuff mm-hmm. to try to get to that <laughs> year and stuff, and like pulled up like the poster the Mm -hmm. ad for the show and stuff like that i'm like this is real you know this is you know because i think in the original book i don't know that he quotes graham parsons in that book and i mean this is something i wanted you know i have a bunch of questions for you about graham parsons Mm -hmm. but like one of the things is like how do we know he was at that show it's i have other quotes from him i don't i don't think that there's a quote from him in that original book about him being at the show. But then I think I have other quotes from him as saying that he did go to that show. Oh yeah. Well, there, the, he did a lot of research. Ben Fong Torres, the guy that wrote that, uh, first biography, uh, Hickory Wind, the life and times of Graham Parsons. Uh, 
Ben Fong Torres was very well respected author, and he was uh, had been a, a, a worked for uh, Rolling Stone magazine. You know, yeah, he's a big uh, wig. He's he's pretty big wig, and uh, um, he Graham went to the Elves concert with the Delano Twins. They were a little older than him. Graham was nine, I believe, when he went to uh, the Elvis Presley show. Yeah, it would have been 56, I believe, was the Elvis Presley show. And Graham was born in 46. And so he would have gone early in the year that he turned 10. So he'd have been nine years old. And supposedly, now I don't know where these quotes originated. I don't either. But uh, supposedly Graham uh, walked backstage and just, you right. know, he was raised. He was he was uh, he was a model kid. You know, he had money. His folks had money. He was raised up very southern, gentle gentleman, charm and sophistication. You know, he he just walked up to Elvis and looked him in the eye and grabbed his hand and said, "Hi, I'm Graham Connor." I'm the little kid that buys your records or something to that effect. Yep. Know? Now, whether that was true, but maybe the Delano twins remembered that. I don't and, know. And then he sang, Love Will Keep Us Together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that's it's it's amazing when you think about that. You remember who else was on that? show that night yeah. the Leuven brothers yeah man yeah the Leuven brothers who the graham sisters, covered right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the carter family right. wow i, mean, that's I remember uh, and you... right at that little place and i always just thought that that was sort of i'm go i go well that's the story right there what is graham known for he's known for bridging the gap between country and rock right what do you have on that show that night? The Lewin Brothers, the Carter Family, Country, Elvis, Rock. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> and Graham. So really. Graham, and years later, as it fast forwards and everything, he hires three members of uh, Elvis Presley's Taking Care of Business Band on his two solo albums. And he records several songs, starting with Way Back in the Birds. He records uh, Leuven Brothers songs through the years. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> that's a great story. That's a great story. So that's a, that so, was there's the, something the in the little, water back then. That was a sure. little pebble that fell into the water and caused these little ripples yeah, to yeah. expound, you know, and then. So have you, so the thing that made me sort of, so I had done research on on that for a long time, and I got those quotes and the Delano twins and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I believe that one, at least one of the Delano twins is still alive, but I don't know. But years later, probably around 2010, still doing research, still putting that into the Internet, trying to find anything that I can, I find a picture of Graham Parsons from that exact time. Have you seen that picture? I've seen uh, a lot of the pictures. school picture the of him from picture, that time yeah. with his, with his hair. Yeah, did you bring it? Kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, so some he's classmate. Got Elvis, he's got the Elvis snarl, yeah. and that is that year. I think uh, it, changed, I it changed his hair dude when he saw it did. Elvis. Hold that up to that camera right there. It's it is. It online. is online. It's. Uh, when we were, you're talking Graham about pictures, we, we, pick. when Charlie Lewin came down here and played at Graham there Parsons, we stayed at the Holiday Inn together, Far and he left. was, yeah. uh, they were selling pictures, or they had pictures, uh, Charlie Lewin, with, in his, with his merch, he had pictures of him, him and his, I think it was him and his brother sitting yeah. on the bed, and then Elvis was on the floor. Wow. There's were, stories like, about him, man. about Elvis, Elvis talking to Leuven Brothers, too, yeah, where like they're, like, messing with him. He goes, this is when some kid from Memphis opened up for us. And they were. Like, they were sort of, like, down-talking Elvis or yeah. whatever. Even during that show, there's quotes from oh, yeah. one of those yeah, yeah, books yeah. where they're like, why are you playing that stuff for them or whatever? And he's like, I play what they want to hear, 
And then when I'm back here, I play what I want to hear, that kind of thing. Like, Elvis was, like, giving it back to them or whatever. Like, they were, like, messing with him. Mm-hmm. They were, like, messing with Elvis because he's, like, some new guy or whatever. Yeah, he was talking about, he was kind of saying, Elvis opened up for us, but then he became, it made bigger. us look, it made us yes. look bigger because Elvis, we could say Elvis played with us. That's right. That happens all the time, too, where the opening band becomes the bigger band. Oh, yeah. man. That's embarrassing. <laughs> That's like a I'm, big no-no. Yeah, I think it was uh, Andy Griffith was uh, touring with Elvis in those early years. Like down the in, Whistling Show, Andy Griffith? Down in Florida, yeah, Andy Griffith. He was a musician as well, right? Well, he was a comedian and, and a musician. He played the guitar, right? And, uh, but he, his big... Uh, draw back in those years was this record, the comedy record called What It Was Was Football. And he does his whole uh, routine. routine, And it was recorded and pressed on a 45 and an album and everything. And he toured on that and uh, he got real hot when when uh, nobody was listening to him. And, uh, and uh, he got off that tour right quick he said i ain't playing with this hot hillbilly and didn't, yeah. and didn't now andy griffith is, it's like there's something with bye bye birdie in there or something like didn't I he see, do bye uh, bye birdie but bye bye birdie is really about elvis going into the army and stuff like that like but yeah, andy griffith yeah. is playing that uh, role i don't remember uh something. if andy did that off in 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 uh, you know broadway or whatever but the movie version was who is Dick Van Dyke? Dick Van Dyke, okay. And Ann but Margaret. it is that is Elvis. Like it's not yeah. they don't say it's Elvis, yeah, but it is. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Like he they're so shipping the, the him first off. Elvis movie is Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that, that, those, that name's not doesn't fly right the same way as it used to, probably. What? Dick Van Dyke? Yeah, you say Dick Van Dyke, you get a whole different movie. <laughs> It's still alive too, Duke Van Dyke, by the way. Still <laughs> yes, doing great. Still yeah, doing great. He's, he's, he's like ninety five something. Yeah, he's, yeah he's Dick Van Dyke and Bye about, Bye Birdie are you, you, you Google either one of those still you get a lot of weird shit. <laughs> yeah, so I brought you this as well. So I, I brought the the younger version of, of Graham and then I brought you this version of Graham too. Oh, cool. Because I think that when you look at that picture, you're kind of like with the young guy a little bit. You're like, is that really him? But then if you compare uh, yeah. it, then you uh, know it great. really that's is awesome. him. Like it's for sure him. Like it's yeah. definitely him. Uh, the, uh, he's got the same snarl on his lips. It's not <clears throat> exactly not, not quite Elvis, but he's it's, sort it's of channeling a, him a, still. It's, it's yeah. A, it's a channeling. You yeah. can see it. You yeah, can see it. It never Elvis. left since that one show. He, it never left. Yeah, like he always had Elvis it. Elvis meets pretty Keith, prominent. Keith Richards. Pretty prominent on the. I guess this is one of the too. last photos of him too. Like right before, because yeah. like yeah. he's wearing yeah. the Burritos Brothers at some taco stand in L.A. Mm-hmm. Right before he goes out to Joshua Tree, and these were photos that went through magazines and stuff. Like you'll see him in Rolling Stone, but like. I guess some. Um, I ordered them a long that? time ago. That that? I didn't. I ordered them, so it's like an old print. You can see That's the nice. the That's measurement awesome. stuff on yeah. there. Where some yeah, it's some magazine. Or something. Thank, Thank you, here. buddy. I appreciate. Man, that. you got it, yeah. man. I mean, you, That's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, it's <laughs> it's you know I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time about Graham, like you and and uh, and Billy Heron. Yeah, you, you know, y'all know the stuff. You know, music and talk to Billy. Yeah, Billy Ray, for sure. Um, now, uh, were you writing a uh, uh, what was it? What would you call it? A screenplay. It is. Uh, it's yeah. a screenplay. How far did you get with that? Yeah, it's complete. It's in really. It. Oh yeah, and so so yeah. I'm gonna you know I I should have sent it to you before the show, but I'll I'll send it to you tonight, and right. you can read it. And you know it's just a draft, but you know I just. I've been working on it for basically since I found out about the whole thing. And mm-hmm. it really is just kind of a, I don't know, kind of a, it's a little bit, it, you know, it's just about the, the, the sort of the days leading up to that show and Waycross in 1956, oh, cool. you know, 
and just yeah, yeah. we should make it happen. We got enough way across town to do that's it. That's what we I got, want, man. We, we got a guy that knows cameras. That's what yeah. I want. So that I mean, really, it's like <clears throat> I mean, when you know, when you when you said come on, I was like, oh yeah, you know it, man. <laughs> I mean, really, I you know, I. I've been wanting to get this sort of out there for a while. And I, you know, I want it to be a, a kind of a, you know, it's not a, it's not a LA movie kind of thing. It's a Waycross movie. I want local people to do it. You know, I want local musicians to be involved in music is a, a big part of it too. You know, part, part of the grand Parsons story too, is like growing up in Cherokee Heights and Mm -hmm. 1600 Swanee and all Mm -hmm. that stuff. And, them having sort of dance parties and sort of lip sync parties mm-hmm. and sort of music on the stoop. Yes. And so like, you know, I want all that stuff and I've, you know, I've researched a lot of it, you know, and, and, and back when I first started, you know, the auditorium was in like horrible, you know, condition. Now it's all been redone. It looks mm-hmm. better than it ever looked. I don't even think it looked like that in like 1956. No, you know? there was a uh, basketball yeah. uh, gym. Right. I mean, it was a combination uh, yeah. basketball gym. But now it looks fantastic. Yeah. Right? It's all redone and stuff. So I'm like, oh, man. I've and never then been the, over there. I need to check it out. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the, like, I agree with like what they spent the money on for that, you know, like redo that for sure. Mm-hmm. Like keep the history, you know. And so, like, all that stuff, and even, like, Cherokee Heights and stuff, it's like, all that stuff looks the same. Like, I grew up there, too. I went to Williams Heights School, like, before mm-hmm. they redid it and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, same time Graham did, you know, like, it looked exactly the same when I went there. I was going there in, like, you know, 79 or whatever, mm-hmm. like, still looked the same as it did in 1956. Same teachers oh, yeah. and stuff. It was uh, facing that side street back yeah. then. Yeah. And so, like, with, you know, all that stuff can be done, you know, and, like, Green Frog and all that sort of way cross history and stuff, yeah. but also just the story of sort of Graham and sort of those shows that you go to that are just, like, life-changing, basically, yeah. you know. They're just like it, just like changed your whole thing, your whole trajectory for sure. Yeah, yeah, man. I I I can't wait to man see what you got. Yeah, yeah. And I should have sent it to you before, but yeah, it's just a draft, and like I just want to like keep going with it, kind of thing. Where it's like if I talk to somebody else and they're like, "Really, this should be like this," you know? Then I'm like, "Then it should," you know? Like I'm just like open, you know? Like I just want to like make it like kind of a group effort kind of thing Heck you know yeah man so that sounds great man yeah uh you know waycross was known for its movies back in the uh 40s and 50s uh when when hollywood started paying attention to the okinoki swamp you know they they recorded uh several movies out at the swamp and they did walter brennan was in he was one of the big names in one of them, and and one of our little uh, local uh, young boys uh, acted in 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 one of them. Uh, he was uh, we had a sheriff back in then, those days called Robert E. Lee, and he actually uh, moved into Graham's house after. You know, Graham's dad had committed suicide in 58. And uh, the uh, mama and Graham and his little sister at that point stayed in Winter Haven after the daddy did that, you know, and the house went up for sale. And eventually, Robert Lee and his family lived there. And this was one of Robert Lee's sons, Charles, who acted in one of the famous Swamp Hollywood movies mm. when he was a little kid. They film a lot of Hollywood movies mm-hmm. in Georgia now. Y'all, oh, yeah. Y'all oh, yeah. Would, they call it. There's some tax breaks for that yeah. stuff, so that's mm-hmm. like a huge deal. But, okay, so 1600 Swanee, where's that house? It's right out the Brunswick Highway now. Where? Right behind uh, go, Guy's we should, we should go to it right now. used car. So that's the house. Okay. That's the house now when why, Robert E. Lee was living why in. Why did they it move it there? It blew up. It blew up. up. Now but, why? Uh, what? Uh, they think that it was Robert Lee that 
it was on the eve of the sheriff's election. Right. And he did that to gain sympathy votes. So they that's think he they, blew it up. They, that's what they considered an option. And, <laughs> and was it just it coincidence destroyed. that he, so he didn't have anything, there was no connection between Robert E. Lee and Graham Parsons or their family or no. anything. He just happened to move into that house, and then it just happened to get blown up, and then they just sheriff's moved election it. of 1969. All right. And they moved it. Now, after the Lees eventually left, uh, I guess it was vacant again, and uh, there was a fella by the name of uh, Wendell Dixon, who was the steel guitar player in uh, Waycross Express. Waycross Express, yeah, yeah man. I know Tony I know. Kaysen. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, of course, that was a... A quartet, kind of like a gospel quartet. I remember the way across. That hired uh, young, capable musicians to ride on their big bus <laughs> and play for next to nothing <laughs> and pay for their own meals. <laughs> sure. But it was the chance to uh, ride on a bus and be in a band, you know. So you Tony Tatums and guys like that, it just kept going through uh they had a lot of members. An evolving yeah. cast of, of, of musicians. But anyhow, Wendell uh, Dixon was a uh, steel guitar player for that group, and uh, uh, he ended up buying the house, cutting it, and he, he and his a brother actually moved houses for a living. And he cut the home into two sections and hauled it out to his property right out the Brunswick Highway, now where um, it's on the right as you're going towards Brunswick, where guys used car lot is. Right. That originally was the, the Dixon's property, and he put it back together a little bit different than the way the original floor plan was. And... Uh, that's where the house sits right now. Got it. So the Florida room's still there? Mm-hmm. The stoop. Man, the y'all stoop. make me feel like Front a, porch stoop. an uneducated Graham fan. <laughs> y'all know where he lived and what kind of layout of the house. Well, I mean, this is like when I was doing the research, I need to know, <laughs> you know. I need to know what it looked and like. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a proof, big part of it. It's proof you need to make this movie happen. So For we can sure. Teach, well, teach so only if you'll be involved. The, uh, I, I, when you said movie, I was thinking. You can got, you shave be, your beard and be a young Graham? <laughs> I'd be a kilo. I wouldn't be a Graham. <laughs> no, but uh, they got a. Uh, you were thinking about, you know, all movies have to have a soundtrack. Oh, yeah. And it would be cool. You got the three, four best songwriters damn know, right. all from Waycross. <laughs> oh, damn right. And they're all Pine obsessed with Spoilers, I'm all over it, man. You can make a, all original music about tell you know the story. It, the score, man. Kind of do the new Fangler yeah, style. That would be wild. Yeah, man. You well, if all, any, uh, you know, it's seriously, it's why I've, you, you know, if I, we got to get the Hallmark chick in here, too. You know it, man. Yeah, Nikki, we'll call up all the, uh, <laughs> trust if me, you're I'm from Wake Ross, you got to be in the Graham movie. <laughs> we'll call she doesn't know it yet. Nikki but I'm in touch. and Katie Strickland <laughs> yeah, have we, them be the Delano sisters. <laughs> we might have to put the, the girl band back together. <laughs> Well, this has been an interesting episode, and it ain't over yet, folks. It's time for uh, Uncle story Dave time telling the week. Story time. So uh, this one is about as relevant as a hot dog is at a hamburger convention. But uh, uh, it hungry. is relevant in one sense uh, when this uh, – yeah, I say this. I have said this before, <laughs> and it's not worked out uh, chronologically, but this podcast should be airing on July the 15th. Okay? That being said, if it does, then <laughs> in five days, 54 years ago, in five more days on July 20th, it'll be the— five more- 54-year anniversary of man's walk on the moon. So there it is. I just spill the beans. But I was just going to say, Justin's ahead of you. So what? 
Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed to see such sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon. Man, those early nursery rhyme writers surely must have been high as the moon on some kind of illegal substance. <laughs> One of the first Mother Goose compositions to plant itself firmly in my childhood imagination, Hey Diddle Diddle, was a good one. Growing up in the early 60s when America and the rest of the world were in the midst of a full-on race to space, it wasn't hard at all for me to imagine a man on the moon, especially if a cow could jump over it. But I was well past nursery rhymes when John Glenn made his first successful orbit around the Earth. Like most eight-year-old kids, I was enamored with space rockets and the astronauts who rode on top of them. One of the breakfast cereal companies included inside each box a small round medallion emblazoned with the likeness of Gus Grissom, John Glenn, Wallace Shara, or Alan Shepard, colorfully etched across the surface. Pretty sure I collected all of them. I never dreamed of being an astronaut, although I loved the 1962 song Tell Star by the Tornadoes, and I did fancy drinking Tang for a while. But I was just intensely intoxicated by the wonders of space travel in that vast void far above my head. With only one television channel to watch as a child, that was CBS, WJXT Channel 4, while living in Waycross, and NBC's WALB Channel 10 when we made our home in a pink house trailer in Albany, Georgia, I was always within earshot of the evening news reports from either Walter Cronkite or Chet Huntley and David Brinkley. It was through those shows that I picked up on John F. Kennedy's bold predictions for America's future in space. This was a time in world history when the two superpowers, the United States and the USSR, us and them, were heavily engaged in a Cold War with nuclear supremacy and the dominance of space, the final frontier, as prime points of contention. Russia had already beaten everybody to the punch, launching cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin to outer space in 1961 for a successful orbit of Earth. The Apollo program, dreamed up during the Eisenhower administration, gave NASA the go-ahead with the lofty plan to land a man on the moon. Finally, in 1969, with the war in Vietnam escalating every day and with a bomb-happy Richard Nixon in control, it seemed like a good idea to me that humankind might need an optional plan B to get the heck off the planet. I recall that Sunday night, July 20th, 54 years ago, sitting on the floor in the middle of the den, staring intently, fascinated at the black and white images on our little TV. Any other Sunday evening, we would have just gotten home from church and the sounds of hee-haw, country music would be bouncing off the walls. That night, the house was hushed, my family fixed on the outer planetary beeps and blips of the lunar module over 239,000 miles away and the casual, unexcited voice of a NASA, NASA communications worker at Mission Control in Houston. We were witnessing history. In my life, one of few positive historical events outside of the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in 64. The awe and anticipation of what was about to happen was palpable. The universe became a little bit smaller as I heard Neil Armstrong proclaim. He said, That's one small step for man. It is much like the high desert of the United States. I was just out there. <laughs> uh, and uh, I can only imagine how uneventful a trip to Disneyland might have been for that guy once he returned safely home.
Neil Armstrong, that is. I could imagine him saying, I'm not going to America's Fourth of July Bicentennial Parade with Johnny Cash as the Grand Marshal. Are you kidding? You got me tickets for the World Series to watch the Miracle Mets and the Baltimore Orioles? Please. I walked on the moon, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Shoot me out of a cannon in a Ferrari doing 200 miles per hour around the top of Mount McKinley Ooh. with Marilyn Monroe and a baby doll negligee riding shotgun. Then I might listen to you. <laughs> Many older folks, including my high school buddy Robin King's daddy, hoo hawed and dismissed the whole event as a ruse. Filmed in the deserts of the Wild West. Space Cowboys. Man's fascination with the conquest of space has only grown since that July night in 1969. The heralded and deadly Challenger space voyages, the Hubble Space Telescope, the International Space Station, the Mars Pathfinder, continue to enthuse and inspire us, only to meet the realization as to just how small and irrelevant we really are compared to it all. We've come a long way since Flash Gordon, H.G. Wells, Captain Kirk, and Luke Skywalker. Most certainly the composer of Hey Diddle Diddle in his most drug-addled state <laughs> 240 years earlier could not have even remotely imagined an American man walking on the surface of the moon. <laughs> hey. That's crazy. It's One, crazy. You need to, we need to Photoshop or edit Graham Parsons landing on the moon. <laughs> All right, one one small step for Graham. <laughs> and then I don't know why I thought that. One giant I leap. think I had a flashback to the uh one small diddle step diddle for in the fiddle Graham. fiddle. One giant <clears> leap <throat> for Emmy Lou. <laughs> Graham was into uh, aliens and stuff, wasn't oh, he? Oh, man. That's why Suppos he went out to Joshua Tree, Supposedly right? Supposedly there was uh, a uh, barber chair on the top of one of those uh, uh, rock, uh, what do you call them? Formation. Formation. One of those rock formations. Did you go out there? No, I've never been. Oh my gosh! Did y'all go to where it is evermore? He went to the actual hotel we, room, right? Oh, we spent the yeah, night. Well, of course, you knew that, but we know, did go did to Joshua Tree. Did they know where he was actually burned? Phil Kaufman suggests that it's Cap Rock, and did y'all uh, go there? We went straight to it, but uh, could not find any clue because uh, uh, back when that happened, it it was. <clears throat> I'm sure it wasn't as policed as 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 well as it, as it is now, but they clean the graffiti off of those rocks probably daily, right? Maybe weekly, and uh, supposedly somewhere out there is a charred rock that was evidence of I don't know. It's also. Uh, <laughs> They mythical. Should, they should, should make. Know. They should make a little <clears throat> marble or rock sculpture out there, and like make the little tribute to them. I know the. Yeah, hotel, and, and I know that, the hotel that's what surprised there. me when we got to Cap Rock. There's a big parking lot there, and you can see Cap Rock formation right there, and then this huge map, uh, billboard map that everybody gets out of the car and walks up to it and says, and the hiking trails, it shows you where you can hike around these other rock formations. Not a word about Graham. Hmm. I guess it's just too uh, yeah, unnatural. I don't know. Uh, too mythological. Too, we don't want to promote that. Really, um, we that's just, how it always yeah. felt here too, and it's really weird. It it's is. maybe yeah. it's him doing that a little bit or something. I I just don't get it exactly. It it just seems so that there's something sort of protecting that whole legacy or something. It's just really weird. Well, well, we need to knock that his shit down. family. <laughs> his family was certainly star crossed. We need we need to warm it up, burn it up a little bit. I think you're right. I think you're or right. Keep 
Keep poking it with I'll a stick like we've been doing when, for 20, 23 yeah. years. Something's got to happen. Winter Haven has certainly made uh, good use of uh, the legacy. Uh, you know, when 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 Graham moved from Waycross to Winter Haven after his father died, uh, he became a teenager down there, and his his uh, mother had remarried the Parsons fella, and, and uh, they had a lot of money at their disposal, as always, and uh, Graham's interest in music just uh, 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 furthered uh, the mom and da- a stepfather to say, well, our son wants to play in a band. Let's build him a venue. So they built the Dairy Down a teenage nightclub down there. And uh, Winter Haven residents nowadays restored the dairy down, and they've been hosting major stars, you know. Uh, um, Jim Lauderdale played down there. I believe uh, they've had s- some pretty big names down there already. Yeah. Uh, not sure if Marty Stewart's played it or not, but I know Paul Thorne, um, Jim I love Lauderdale. Paul Thorne. He's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I but you there what. you go, man. They're they're <laughs> they're doing quite well with making use of the legacy. Interesting. And uh, it's just, and I'm not saying that in a bad way, right, 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 or right. anything. Yeah. I mean, surely uh, it's. Probably a uh, 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 a nonprofit organization that's doing it, you know, but uh, they're able to sell tickets to these stars and everything. And uh, uh, they had Chris Hillman down there of the Birds and the Flying Burrito Brothers. So more power to them, and yeah, and they're sure. also uh, uh. Emphasizing Graham's legacy and his and his history and this old music thing, you know, so good for them. This I don't know if, if White Cross is ever going to catch up or not. Or really did you ever? <laughs> this is a random question. I, did, I, I, did you ever see Graham live? No, no. When you look at it now, he was born in forty six. Me in fifty three. Ray in fifty two. When I say Ray, that's Billy Ray. Uh, so. We were, uh, he was six and seven when we were born. Okay. Now you add that he left Waycross in 58 when he was, uh, about 12 years old. That would have made us five and six. Uh, what 12 year old boy is going to be hanging around with a five or six year old boy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we were on. I was just wondering if you he ever, was if in you Cherokee Heights. We were on Dog Hill. Mm-hmm. So, I was just wondering if you ever just saw little, his band. Just missed him ba- barely. Oh, you talking about in later years? Yeah, like have you ever seen? Well, him play? we didn't even know who he was until yeah, uh, be- three months before he died. And before the internet, yeah. I guess. There you go. I mean, that was we were we were actually growing up in yeah. exactly the way you described the. Uh, 90s. Yeah, it's funny. It 90s. didn't change that much from the time from that you were a kid to, to the time before the internet. There was no, you had to, if you needed to dig stuff up, it was talking to people, it was going to the library, microfiche. Exactly. Like that was it. Like that, you could not do any. Now we could, with AI, we could probably go see Graham. <laughs> somebody. We day. get Graham to act in your movie. Hey, trust me. <laughs> it's there, man. I'll tell you some of the stuff. It'd be it AI, comes Graham, up. one small step for. <laughs> Hey, There's I some in there. Trust oh, me. Oh Lord, <laughs> it's it's there. <laughs> Giant leap for AI. Yeah. So in the script, there is a DJ that's based off of Michael James's dad, who was a yeah. DJ at the time. Mm-hmm. And right now, I'm talking to Michael and uh, Bert's other son, Jeremy, and June, and stuff like that, and trying to figure out how. Because they have recordings of Bert James. I think his name was Bob Green at the time. Well, uh, now Bert was the his brother. Michael's daddy would have been. Uh, no, Bert's Michael's dad. Bert James, married to June. I thought Bert ran the sports. I thought that was Bert. What was his name? That was 
Michael's uncle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, Julie uh, James's dad. I can't um, remember. So, Anyhow, so okay. Hit, so Bert was a DJ yeah. back in the 50s, 60s. 60s, I believe. I think you went by the name of Bob Green at the time. This is stuff I've pieced together. I actually mm-hmm. have a 45 of his when he used to be a DJ. And what I want to do is grab his voice. I don't know if you guys have seen this with AI, but there's an actual like program out there. There's an actual like, company out there where you can just feed it. Oh, wow. um, a voice, a basically. Scary and cool at the same time. And then you type in what you want it to say, and it's got the inflection down. It's mm-hmm. got it all, man. And so what I want to do is I want to take, because in the script is a DJ that's actually sort of guiding you through to sort of the narrator or whatever, wow. sort of guides you through <laughs> and says, like, the show's coming up, and Graham's all excited about the show. Yeah. And I want that to be... Bob Green, Burt James, and use the actual voice and have that in the movie as the voice. You with, know, like with that's your, how it, with your words, yeah, with, your with, with whatever you write for yeah. him. You know, and, and and also listening to that stuff and using stuff from the time, using phrasing from the time and stuff like that. You know, making sure you get it right. But then using that guy's actual voice to do it, you know, mm-hmm. it's like beautiful. Like, I love it. Yeah, I, I read about that uh, about a year or so ago, but I was telling my folks during Christmas holidays, my sister and brother and all, that, you know, with the AI thing, we could have mama's uh, voice yeah. channeled where it would be like uh, uh, a... Uh, Answering machine, a uh, message yeah, on yeah, an that'd answer be, that'd machine, be awesome. yeah. which would just—I'm sure it would just. Yes. You oh my probably, God! There's, well, no, our, it, there's our mama. Again but then attach a to us, attach you know? a personality to that so that you can talk to that or whatever. Yeah. Imagine oh, that, where you can, where it's talking where back you to you and you're Imagine yes, it. and we it's using. It, uh, you know, all the stuff that mm-hmm. that person used to talk mm-hmm. and the way that it phrased things. Just and doing simple shit, like put it on your car, the voice in your car, yeah. or Siri, just make it your... Just to be comfortable. No, you know, make yeah. it your mom's yes. voice or something. Yeah. yeah. Be like, yes. that would be creepy. She's, but- yeah, she's been gone since uh, 94, you know, and to just have her as... As Siri or, yes. or or Alexa, yeah. I love it. You know, oh. he can and say, "Hey, mom, tell it'd me what." Be, I- it'd be strange, but it, God, that's it could weird. be. Fast. I've heard about people when right before they Creepy, die recording a message to put on a card or something. Yeah, but like that, if you could just do it where. It could talk by itself. Or you can just have a conversation, which is, it's there. Like, it's, Mm -hmm. the technology is there now. Now, I wouldn't have any memories of me. Only if you fed it to it, though. Like, if you you gave it it that stuff, then it could have those memories. And it could respond, (laughs) yes. Oh, that would be creepy. Remember when you found my pot in in my tennis ball can? if If your phone can overhear you. Talking about something and then give you an ad for it, that, uh, then yeah, it could Surely listen to you. If, <laughs> if you're telling it information, it could spit it, it back. Can to definitely you. do that. Yeah, exactly. Hey, it could feed a lot of historical memory. Yeah, information. Yeah, that and that could it, could ramp it right into. Uh, this shit will freak you out a little bit. If you, it's like Fight Club. Yeah, it is. Like, wild. Is this real or fake or? I mean, you know, it's fake, and it still would probably be feel real. Yeah, 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 it's a it's a psychological sort of thing where you're like, can it, it? And and for creative stuff, you know, for for writing and 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 for that that type of stuff, if you're not really trying to, you know, I don't see any moral issues with you know, just asking this thing, you know, sort of sort of creative endeavors as as if it's a writing partner or something like i don't see anything wrong with that at all i see that as some sort of tool you I know i want to try to write a song with it oh it's so fun man well, it's how just do you fun do it? to see know, where do you go to do that well so just so start with chat gpt first of all just chat gpt is like the sort of the the work the text version of ai where you can sort of talk to it and figure it out and the good the cool thing about it is you just sort of ask AI about AI. So you can be like, 
well, what are the good music AI programs? And it can give you oh, shit. It can give you the ones, and then you can go to it and see. And like I said, like for the music stuff, it's it's all about you know. I am not a musician, so I don't know that stuff. You know, so but I do know like writing and sort of English and stuff like that. So so I can sort of see what it can do with that. But for music stuff, you know, I just want. Like everybody I know that's like some musician or whatever, I'm like go check it out, you know, like go see what you can do with it because like it could be something that somebody could just like you know take and like multiply their talent by like millions, basically, you know, it's just like that crazy. But it, it, it seems uh, it's almost like cheating, you know. If you were to be able to go go to AI and say. Having a little trouble with this song. Can you uh, finish it as if Paul McCartney would? Yeah. <laughs> and it shoots you, and this, it does. shoots you this incredible song like that movie mm-hmm. about the guy that uh, <laughs> was the only one on earth that uh, remembered the Beatles. Yeah, yeah, songs, that, yes, you know? that movie was great. <laughs> it was yeah, a yeah, fantastic yeah. movie. And well, Ed written. Sheeran was saying, oh. that's incredible. <laughs> He says, Imagine he if won, he, he but won. that would be true. Like if, you, if, road, you know? if you could write all the Beatles songs and nobody and nobody knew them, and they thought you just. But see, his guilt got the best of him. By the end of the movie, he found. Imagine where all the come clean. The guilt and pride and all the emotions and feelings and mental illness that AI is going to cause from that we don't even know about yet. <laughs> I don't want to sound like David Bowie freaking out. Like no, but he was on like the space, stuff, right? Space he knew Odyssey stuff. or something. Yeah, man. <laughs> he knew stuff. <laughs> well, folks, as I say, you heard it here first. Let's and, write a song, uh, a real one, just so we, we, we just, can prove uh, that we're better we're than just AI. Open, we're just opening up this can of worms, folks. We're we're not responsible for anything. We're just going to open it up a little bit of time. Hey, Siri, how do you open up a can of worms? Stop it. <laughs> Have you ever asked Siri, <laughs> what's try. the best way to bury a dead body? <laughs> It'll tell you. Which oh, is- it is, uh, and furthermore, I'm forwarding your phone number to the FBI. <laughs> One time it gives you it came up with map quest. It was like give me an actual <laughs> address. Best places. Here's the GPS. No one will see it. <laughs> Alligators and wild hogs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um yeah, I can see definitely AI is gonna be a moving force. I won't be here to see all the Trouble it you don't causes. know how fast it's moving, man. You <laughs> oh, might man. be. I might be. I understand. All right, self right, time. Self time. <laughs> Yo. Uh, One of them will have to be at least. I, uh, uh, I, I read probably get Justin. about 15, 20 years ago in a doctor's office uh, that <laughs> um, they were uh, fast on the verge of identifying an anti-aging thing, and it's probably already been yeah, identified. Already it's the, the stem cell stuff Joe Biden and all that. And not yet, oh, <laughs> but but we could uh, we can <laughs> we can about the point where it started talking about the AI, we could. Cut that little <laughs> excerpt right there after I sign us off. We can cut that out of the regular. Well, I don't know what I'm doing sitting here talking like we're off the air already. But shit. Are we still recording? Uh, actually. Tell the people good night. Hello, yeah, my baby. Hello, my darling. Hello, my right. Oh, we got to end with uh, Love Will Keep Us Together. <laughs> All right, folks. We sure appreciate y'all watching. And listening this time, be sure to like and subscribe and do all the things that we love for you to do. Email us at somethingwaterpodcast at gmail.com or visit our actual official website, somethingwaterpodcast.com, where you can find all kinds of stuff, merchandise and uh, our Patreon link to our patreon.com account, The Deep End, something in the water, The Deep End, which is only $5 a month. I want to thank Ty. For sitting in for Sean, he, 
you done a good job. Yeah, this is going out to Sean. <laughs> and want to thank our buddy Jim Parker for being thank our you. guest this time. That was very interesting, buddy. We had a good time. I appreciate you having <laughs> me, man. Absolutely, man. It was man. great. And uh, just for uh, uh, gits and shiggles, uh, if you want to take us out, would love will keep us together. Uh, that'd be fun. Da -da. Dun, 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 dun. Love. I got it right here. Da -da -da. Oh, you got some backup music. Boom. 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 Love will keep us together. You. Yep. Think of me, babe, whenever. Songs we talking. Don't go long. Singing a song. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, and you know you just gotta be wrong to stop. Hey.